to talk about immunity certification, I've, I've organized my thoughts in, in a sort of, um, uh, first with the sort of science and medicine, even though my, um, my doctoral training is in philosophy and I focus on ethics and public health policy, as Joel was saying, I have an undergraduate degree in molecular biology. So it's a long time ago, it's out of date, but I can pretend on the science. And among the things my colleagues who actually do know the science are talking about is uh, before we talk about certification of immunity, we have to understand whether there is immunity. And so one prior question that needs to be resolved, and it's really a science and medicine question, is whether those who have been infected by this virus and recover have immunity from reinfection. It's a, obviously a basic and fundamental question that needs to be resolved. If the answer to that is yes, there's, there's still a sort of a, an underlying basic question about whether everyone who's been infected has immunity. So there may be infections that are so subclinical, asymptomatic, that they don't provide sufficient antibodies to, to protect, but we don't know, of course. Then if there is immunity provided uh, by recovery from infection, for how long does that last? That may be a, a function of both the way this virus works with our immunology, but also it may be a function of whether this virus is mutating, is changing over time. So that's why we need to get vaccinated for flu every season and we don't get immunity once we've been infected from year to year because the virus changes. The last sort of basic scientific medical question is even if you have immunity, and we know the answers to the questions that I've um, asked so far, and the answer is yes, you get immunity, and yes, we can. Um, we know that it works for some period of time. Can you, even though you're immune, infect other people? Uh, you, if you're exposed, could you bring it back into your home, bring it to the school where you're teaching, to the place where you're working, which is, of course, a critical bit of information. So that's, that's one set of questions, none of which have been answered. The second set of questions is whether we can test for that immunity if it exists. So among the things that have been um, part of the scramble is to, first of all, create a diagnostic test to assess titer, that is the level of immunity of antibodies in a person's blood that might provide immunity and do that in a way that is reliable. In public health, that's called positive predictive value, which is a combination of false positive rate and false negative rate. So you don't want people to test that they are immune when they're not, and likewise, you don't want people to test not immune when they are. So we need, we need tests that work, and that has yet to be created, um, partly because we don't know whether there is immunity provided. But let's assume those things all play out in a way that, yes, people get immunity from um, once they're infected and recover, and second, that we can test for it in a way that is reliable. So then we get into the implications, which I think is probably more of the kind of conversation we wanna have today. And understanding this is all incredibly prospective, just in the way that Effie's remarks were, sort of try to think ahead about how um, certificates of immunity would be used. So one question we would need to answer is, what would they permit people to do? So we, I think, are mostly thinking about this, at least in the way the popular um, media has portrayed it, is these would be kind of get out of our house free cards, right? We don't have to stay um, in quarantine and socially distance anymore if we have a, some kind of certificate of immunity. But we also have to think about the other side of that, which is what would they require? So if you have immunity and other people do not, we need people to do things that, that allow our communities and our society and our economy to reopen. And if not everybody is immune, we want those who are immune to be doing the things that allow that first. So that's actually a kind of different flip. It's not all about liberty. It's also about responsibility. You might have different responsibilities if you're immune than if you were not. Then we have to ask, what would the social consequences of this sort of, of permit um, be? So clearly it's a way of thinking about the fitness of some people versus the fitness of others. And when we start to talk that way, it starts to feel very potentially stigmatizing and labeling in ways that um, have had, of course, a horrible history uh, in, in the, the world over time in terms of some people being singled out because they were less fit than others without putting too fine a point on it. Um, yesterday was Yom HaShoah. Uh, Holocaust Remembrance Day. So it's, it's very reminiscent of the idea that we will label certain people um, as having a level of fitness that is greater than others and somehow therefore more deserving than others. And that, of course, we have to somehow work against. 
So while there may be fewer restrictions for some who have this sort of um, level of immunity, we have to figure out how to help use that in a positive way for those who are not yet immune. And, and realize all of the conversations we're talking about are very premature, but even as they become less premature, um, there still be very, very small proportions of the population who have, will have been exposed and recovered, at least in the United States, and I think, well, really everywhere in the world. It's a t tiny fraction of the population of any of the countries that are thinking about this. So, okay, all of those things would need to be addressed, resolved, um, prepared for. Mm -hmm.